is risen indeed. Well, it's good to be here on this uh, 35th Easter Sunday with First Baptist Indian Trail. Good to be with you. <clears throat> Jim Henry, the uh, long-term pastor at First Baptist in Orlando, Florida, uh, who was with us a few weeks ago, called yesterday and uh, he said, what are you preaching tomorrow? And uh, I told him, I said, I'm going to be preaching on the proof of the resurrection. And he said, is this something that you have done before uh, or is this something new? And I told him, I said, this will be my 35th new Easter uh, uh, sermon. And uh, he, he, it's always good when you can bake fresh bread on these special day. So it's a deep honor of mine uh, to just bring the Word of God to you this morning. Uh, thank you so much. I didn't have time. Uh, the, the thing about the 11 o'clock service, uh, I can just stay as long as I want to stay. You know, that's just the neat thing about it. But uh, there's no time restraints and I didn't get to do a whole lot of this. But thank you for last week and thank you for all of the cards and the wonderful expressions of love. Uh, Kathy and I are just in deep gratitude and love for you, and uh, just your expressions have been absolutely phenomenal. We're still going, we haven't got through all the cards yet, we're still uh, going through those cards, and it's, we, we're reading every word and making notes and, and really making sure that we uh, savor every moment uh, together with them. And so thank you deeply. Now I'll ask you a question this Easter Sunday. If um, a skeptic were to walk up to you, an unbeliever were to come to you and say to you, you know, I, I don't believe in this Christian movement. I don't believe in this Christianity stuff. But I would believe if you could convince me that Jesus rose from the dead. How would you approach it? Where would you go from there? Some of you probably would start stuttering a little bit and, well, 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 I've got my pastor on speed dial, I'll call him for you, you know, or my Sunday school teacher or something like that because you wouldn't, you wouldn't have a clue where to start. But you know, in, in this culture in which we're living, the possibility of that happening is extremely good. Uh, somebody would just walk up, they, they see a difference in your life and they, I want what you got. If you can just prove to me that Jesus did come out of that grave on the third day, I'll believe, I'll trust. Where would you take that person? Well, I pray that after today, uh, you'll have a great handle on what to do and what to say, if that and when that day would ever arise. So today, we're just going to kind of convert this auditorium into a classroom. And I'll be a lot more instructional today then I am going to be sermonic. So take your Bible with me, if you will, and look to 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15. And uh, would you stand with me in the honor and the reverence of the reading of the Word of God? 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And let's begin reading in verse number 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain. No use to be here on Sunday morning. No need for me to work hours on messages because it would be of none effect. Preaching is in vain. Your faith is also in vain. You're wasting your time. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we've testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he raised not up. If so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ... We are of all men most miserable. But now, I like this. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, <clears throat> once again, we ask that uh, you anoint and unctionize with your Holy Spirit this messenger, this message. 
Uh, Lord, not for fame or fortune, but to the end that someone might believe. And in believing, they might have everlasting life. I ask this now in the name that is above all names, Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Please uh, be seated. Now, the resurrection is undeniably, unapologetically confirmed. There are no hazies. There are no probability ifs about the resurrection. He is risen. It is confirmed. It is solidified without a doubt. Now, there are some confirmations, and I hope you've got pen, paper, you'll write some of this down because maybe put it in the fly leaf of your Bible. You're going to need it sometime in the future. The first confirmation that I want to share with you is that the resurrection is confirmed by Bible prophecy. Turn in your Bible to Psalm chapter 16 and verse number 10. Psalm chapter 16 and verse number 10, if you will. The Bible says this, and this is one of those messianic psalms. This is a psalm about Christ. And you'll notice by the personal pronouns that he is speaking here about himself. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Turn over a few pages to Psalm 49. Psalm 49, I want you to see verse 15 with me. Psalm 49 And uh, verse 15, listen to this. But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me. He's not indicating whatsoever here that death is any kind of permanence uh, in his life at all, that he's going to rise from the dead. But now, hear my heart a minute. The greatest biblical prophecy the most prominent and predominant of the biblical prophecy is found from the words of the Lord Jesus himself. Hear this now, don't forget this. At no time will you find Jesus talking about his impending death that leaves out the fact of his resurrection. Every time Jesus ever talked about dying, he Put in there, I will rise again without fail, without exception. Uh, Look at Matthew chapter uh, 12, if you will, in uh, the first gospel. Matthew chapter 12. And uh, you're going to see exactly what I am referring to in verse number 38. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 38. Listen to this. Then certain of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from you. He answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. There shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. And then he gives us a timeline about his death, how long that he would die. Watch this. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. How very prophetic. Look at chapter 16, same book, verse 21. Chapter 16, verse 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. There it is again. Bible prophecy. Mark down somewhere in your notes. Mark chapter 9 and verse number 9. He reiterates the very same thing. Mark again in John chapter 2 and verse number 18 and following. I'll give you the narrative if you will allow me. Uh, Jesus and his disciples were standing somewhere near the temple mount. And uh, Jesus said, you destroy that temple and in three days I am going to build it back. Now, can you imagine the disciples as they were thinking to themselves, they are hearing the words of Jesus. What? Now, we know that you're a good carpenter. But the next verse says that the disciples said, wait a minute, Lord. It took 46 years to build this temple. And you saying that you can 
rebuild it in three days? But then the next verse says, but he was not speaking about the temple. He was speaking about his body. Biblical prophecy. It's very significant because the fact of the matter is, ladies and gentlemen, this thing of Christianity, and by the way, Christianity is not a religion. It is a way of life. But everything about Christianity hinges on the resurrection. If you take away the resurrection, then the movement of Christianity will collapse like a house of cards. Now, Jesus is saying something here that would, if it's not true, would sound like a lunatic. But because it is truth, it's Bible prophecy that God has revealed to you and me the reality of the resurrection confirmed by Bible prophecy. Now, the second thing I want to share with you is his, con his enemies confirmed the resurrection. His enemies confirmed it. Look at Matthew chapter 28, the last chapter in that first gospel. Matthew chapter 28. The Holy Spirit absolutely is amazing how he breathed into the writers of Scripture, even to the point that God wanted us to know that he used even the enemies of Christ to confirm that Jesus didn't stay in the grave, that he rose from the dead. From the dead. In, in chapter number 28, look at verse 11. Now when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priests all the things were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, watch this in verse 12, they gave large money unto the soldiers saying, now here's what we want you to do. We want you to propagate this lie that the disciples came at night and stole the body of Jesus. Now watch it, watch it. Um, and if this come to the governor, in verse 14, we will persuade him and secure you. So they said, here's some hush money. You go propagate this uh, false idea that the friends of Jesus stole away the body of the Lord. It is amazing how that the enemies of Jesus did everything they could to stamp out the reality of the resurrection when it occurred. God confirmed it through the enemies again in the book of Acts. You go read and study the book of Acts. You read the sermons of the Apostle Paul. You read all of the sermons of Simon Peter. And not one time do the Jewish authorities ever come and confront them and really uh, defy the message of the resurrection. Why? Because it was a well-known fact by then that they could not dispute. The enemies could not challenge the Apostle Paul. They couldn't challenge the Apostle Peter. God used the enemies of the Lord to confirm his resurrection. Number three, the guards themselves confirmed the resurrection. I love this next part. In Matthew chapter 27, just a, a few verses up from 28, look at verse 50, 65. Pilate said unto them, now you have a watch, go your way, make it as sure as you can. So they went and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. Three beautiful truths arise out of this. Pilate says to those guards, now men, I want you to make sure that no matter what you do, you make sure nothing happens to that body. You make sure no one comes to that tomb. You make sure that it is protected. So truth number one is that they took security measures. I don't know what all of those measures were. The Bible doesn't say. Truth number two, he says, I want you to put a guard out there. Now, if you know anything about the Roman Praetorian, then you're going to know that uh, a guard... Uh, consisted of at the minimum of four Roman soldiers and as many as 16. So there were all kinds of Roman soldiers standing outside. Truth number three, they then put a Roman seal around that stone that sealed it to the quarry from which that tomb had been hewn out. So you've got the security measures, you've got the guards, you've got the seal that was there. Now, the guards 
are a dead giveaway, if you will, to confirm that something very significant happened that night. Now look at verse 2 of 28. Behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. Get a picture with me. It's three o'clock in the morning. Blackest part of the night. You're assigned to guard a dead man. You're in a cemetery. Behind you is a tomb. Three o'clock in the morning. And all of a sudden, God says, come here, earthquake angel. Go down there and shake a few things up. So the earthquake angel shows up. And these soldiers, they looked and the ground began to shake underneath them. And that rock that had been sealed up rolled away. And the Bible says, I'm going to tell you what, if it had been me, I'd, I'd have been out of there, buddy. You wouldn't going to, I'd have been gone. But the Bible says that these Roman soldiers were catatonic. They were mortified. They were stiff as a board. They couldn't speak. They couldn't do anything there when the resurrection occurred. Look, 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 look here, ladies and gentlemen. These guards shook for fear. The very fact of their reaction to the resurrection is what God put in Scripture to confirm that he is alive forevermore. Now, let me give you number four. You ready? Now, there are times that I know you are tempted to go to sleep on a Sunday during a sermon. Can I just tell you, this is not one of those times. You will want to wake up to hear what's about to happen. Number four, the grave clothes themselves testified of the resurrection. Now, we're in John chapter 20. I hope you got your Bibles. John chapter number 20. And I want you to begin reading in verse number one. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene uh, had, had, had been touched by the Lord. Uh, he had really changed her life, performed a miracle. She was no longer uh, that prostitute. She was no longer a lady of immorality. She was a woman of faith. And she shows up early when it was yet dark unto the sepulcher and seeth that the stone had been taken away from the sepulcher. She runs and comes to Simon Peter, to the other disciple, who is John, whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away my Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth, and the other disciple came to the sepulcher. They ran both together. The other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. He stooping down, looking in, and saw what? The linen clothes lying, mm. yet went he not in. Then come a Simon Peter following him and went to the sepulcher and sees what? Linen clothes lie. And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. All right, I got a little bit of sanctified imagination. I have uh, a mental image of what I think Simon Peter looks like. I believe he's this big, gruffy, scruffy, rotunded individual all right off of the shipping vessels. I got a picture of John. He's like a cross-country runner. He, he's got on his Adidas outfit and his sketcher shoes. Here comes Mary. Mary says, you're not going to believe it, but that, 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 that the stone's been rolled away. And they, they've taken Jesus' body someplace. And so here the Bible says they get to running toward the grave. Now, the cross-country runner has outrun the fat boy, Simon Peter. <laughs> He's got 100 yards on him. He shows up at the edge of the sepulcher. He doesn't go in. 
Now, old, old Simon Peter, he's got a head of steam up. He's, he's going lumbering down through there at a pace that he cannot stop. And he just brushes right on by into the tomb. And, and the Bible says something in verse 5. The Bible says something in verse 6 that's absolutely astonishing. And when the Bible is repetitive, you listening? Say amen. amen. When the Bible is repetitive about something, it is the Holy Spirit's way of saying, perk up, pay attention. This is important. In verse 5, they saw the linen clothes lying. If you look at the original language, the original language says that it is lying in the exact same original position that it was when it was wrapped around the body of Jesus. For Jesus had metamorphically emanated out of those grave clothes and he left them exactly in the same position that they were in when they were around his body. You say, is that important? Absolutely. Look at verse 8. Then went in that other disciple which came first to the sepulcher. Listen. And he saw and believed. What did he see? He didn't see the body of Jesus. He saw the grave clothes in the exact position that they were. And he believed. It gets gooder. Look at verse 11. Mary stood out the sepulcher, weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and she looked into the sepulcher. And she sees two angels in white sitting the one where? And the other at where the body of Jesus had lain. May, may I say here, the contention is that these rags were not wadded up and thrown over into the corner and left behind. How was she able to distinguish the head from the feet? Because they were in the same position that they were when Jesus had them on. If you look at any Jewish encyclopedia, when it talks about uh, getting the body and preparing the body and, and embalming the body and getting it ready for burial, they would take that gauze and they would take those cloths and they would wrap the body with the aloes and the spices. But then they would leave a space about an inch between the body grave clothes and that which would be wrapped around the head for reverence for the head. They were separated uh, from each other. Powerful, powerful word here. She saw the head and she saw the feet as they were positioned. You ask the questions here. What, 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 is it, what does that prove or what does it disprove? You, you, you have to understand this disproves that the body of Jesus had been stolen. Who in their right mind would steal a body and fix it? Just take the time to stretch everything out and put it. No, 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 no. You would have jerked that body up and you would have carried them grave clothes and all. At the very least, you would have taken them off and thrown them over. to the. You wouldn't have wasted the opportunity to get away from there in a hurry. Who would have stolen him anyway? Who would have stolen the body of Jesus? Only two groups of people would have ever stolen the body, the friends of Jesus or the enemies of Jesus. Now, the friends of Jesus could have never stolen the body because there was security measures. There was guards. There was a seal. They could not have stolen the body. The enemies didn't steal the body. Why would they not steal the body? Well, I told you that everything about the Christian lifestyle hinges on the validity and the veracity of the resurrection. If you wanted to stop that movement, all you would have to do is to produce the body and say, look here, there is no resurrection because here is the body. The friends did not steal the body. The enemies did not take the body. He arose from the dead. Let me give you number five. Jesus' dead body confirmed the resurrection. 
I, I don't want to get into a lot of great detail here, but let me just give you some confirmations. In John chapter number 19, uh, look with me, if you will, at verse 32. Then came the soldiers, break the legs of the first, and the other was crucified with him. They, they, they came in verse 33 to break his legs, but they discovered that he was what? Dead already. 34 is the second confirmation. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came out, what? Blood and water. The composition of the blood had now broken down. And that only occurs after death. So there's another medical evidence. Now notice verse 38 and 40. It's very interesting. Uh, after this, Joseph came. He wanted the body. He got the body. Nicodemus came in verse 39. Now watch this. And brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds weight. They took the body, wound it in linen clothes with spices, as the manner of the Jews is to bury. 100 pounds of spices. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a medical fact that if a body is still alive, when they wrap that hundred pounds of spices and aloes around them to get them ready for bury, they're going to die in a matter of minutes following that if they were not dead already. But Jesus was dead already when they took his body down off the cross. His body is confirmation. Number six, former doubters confirm the resurrection. In John chapter 20, powerful word, I'll give you a little bit of background. Jesus made an appearance to the disciples, but Thomas was not there. When the disciples hooked up again with Thomas uh, and told him that they had seen Jesus, he said, I don't believe it. And I won't believe it until I put my hands in his hands and I put my hand in his side. Eight days later, Jesus shows up. Uh, watch this with me in verse 26. After eight days, again, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Hey, Thomas, I'm going to give you what you wanted. Take your finger and put it in these scars. Take your hand and put it on my Side. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. A former doubter who became a believer, confirming the resurrection. Charles Ingersoll, you may have read about his skepticism. Um, he was the kind of guy that would show up at every church service that he could, every religious gathering that he could, and he was, showed up at this church, and the preacher was preaching on the power of the resurrected life. And he was using Lazarus uh, as his text. He got to that part where Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came up out of the grave, and Charles Ingersoll said, no, that's not true. That's a lie. Don't believe this stuff. He says, and I can prove that it's a lie. He said, what happened was Jesus got him somebody ahead of time and said, here's the cue. When I say, Lazarus, you come walking out of that grave. Why didn't he just say, come forth? Why did he personify Lazarus to come forth? And the preacher says, hold it right there. He says, I'll tell you why he didn't say come forth. For had he just said come forth, every dead person in the cemetery would have got up and walked out. <laughs> Doubters are still with us, but aren't you glad that Jesus is still calling Lazarus out of the tombs? The last confirmation is his appearances confirms his resurrection. In, in John chapter 20 and verse number 14, Mary Magdalene was there. Isn't it amazing how that the, the Bible gives us the faith of women and how God used them uh, mightily to spread the gospel. 
In verse 14, she was the very first one to see him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, why, why are you crying? Why, why, why is that? And she's supposing him to be the gardener. Sir, wh what, what have you done with his body? Tell me where you've laid him. I, I, I want to take him away. And Jesus said, Mary... He appeared first to Mary. A few days later, he, or a few little while later, he appeared to the other women that had shown up there to the grave. He appeared to Simon Peter. He appeared to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. He appeared to the apostles minus Thomas. He appeared to the apostles with Thomas present. He appeared to the seven by the Sea of Tiberias where he encountered the Lord Jesus or where he encountered Simon Peter. And do you love me, Simon? Do you love me? Do you love me? He appeared again to the 500 at one time. He appeared to James. He appeared to the 11 uh, in Mark chapter 16. He appeared on the Mount of Ascension. He appeared in the road to Damascus where he changed Saul into Paul. He appeared to Stephen in Acts chapter 7. He appeared then to John on the Isle of Patmos. All of these appearances took place unbeknownst to the others. Had he appeared just to one man at one time, there might have been room for some skepticism and some questions. But when you put all of these appearances and combine them together, it does nothing but confirm the reality of the resurrection. Do you want to know, though, what the real confirmation of the resurrection is? It is the transformation that occurs when someone encounters the power of the resurrection. You understand that the resurrection transformed Simon Peter who could not even confess Jesus before some little woman by a fire into a great preacher to thousands of people. He transformed the Sabbath into Sunday. He transformed Saul into Paul. The resurrection transformed a little remnant of believers into a mighty army called the church. He transformed 11 misguided, scared, um, spineless men who had huddled up into a corner in an upper room and transformed them into a little company of the committed who outmarched and who outloved and who outgave and who outprayed and who outdied their Roman contemporaries and turned the world right side up for Jesus. That is confirmation of the resurrection. If we had time today, and we don't, and I won't take it, I could put a microphone in the hands of dozens and dozens and dozens and hundreds of people that are in this auditorium today, and they could stand and testify. Let me tell you how the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus Christ transformed my life from a chaotic existence into a life of purpose and meaning. My prayer is, is that same confirmation of the resurrection power will occur in these next few minutes. Because he lives, we live. About 35 or 40 years ago, there was a lady who sang at a Bible conference. And she sang one of my favorite, favorite hymns of all time. I used to lead when I was a minister of music. Powerful, powerful word. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. And the, and the, and the verse goes on. He walks with me and he talks with me along life's narrow way. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. When she finished singing that old hymn, the preacher came up and said, ma'am, what's he saying to you? She said, I'm sorry, I don't understand your question. He said, well, I thoroughly enjoyed your song. I enjoyed the hymn. You, you did it very beautifully and eloquently, and I, I was moved in the spirit. I thank you for it. But I just want to know, 
You said he walks with you and he talks with you. What's he saying to you? She looked back at him and she said, oh, preacher, that's just the words of a song. I got news for the view. He walks with me. He talks with me. The resurrected Lord Jesus is alive today. But to many of you, it could be just words to a song. He's so much more. In a moment, I'm going to lead us in a prayer. And I pray that the resurrection manifests in the transformation of somebody's life here today. Would you stand with me as we go to God in prayer? Every head bowed and every eye closed in the very stillness and the quietness of these next few moments. There's not any more important time today than what we're in right now. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be so real and so obvious into somebody's heart and life that's here, <clears throat> whose heart's pounding, whose palms are sweaty, whose mind is spinning, wanting to know what that resurrection power is really like. And, and Lord, you are confirming in some unusual ways to them right now that, Lord, they need you. And they can't make it anymore without you. And because you live, they can live too.